everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Jennifer Laflamme, and I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And um, we help organize these college hours. So um, I want to welcome you, let you know that you're always welcome to college hour. Um, we have our next one on October 24th. And also, I want to thank uh, Professor Ricardo Caton for putting this, um, this event on for us today. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes? All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, very thankful to the college for giving me this opportunity to discuss the contributions, some of the contributions, by the way, that certainly uh, Latinos have made. Actually, uh, Rod, would you like to make it? Um, some of the contributions that Latinos have made certainly to our nation. And by our nation, I mean all of our nation, right? our country. I gotta admit that I had this presentation ready to go for you, um, but this morning I was given some news, that perhaps not news to you, but certainly was news to me. And I thought, I need to discuss this. And it's very fitting because indeed, we tend to have these quote unquote months that we celebrate, right? Uh, Women's History Month or African American History Month, in this case, Hispanic Heritage Month, quote unquote, uh, September through October. And the notion is that our government itself is desiring to bring to light those contributions, those things that have made our country great. But unfortunately, despite all the information I'm going to give you today, this tends to be the rhetoric that we think of when we think Latinos. It is this rhetoric, these comments, that unfortunately the focus is placed on when we think Latinos, Mexicans in particular. This is the idea that this is the only contribution that has been made in this country by Latinos. This is presidential candidate Trump back in 2015 with his now infamous, although famous for some, unfortunately, words. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. I don't know, maybe, not sure. Haven't really looked into it. So it's this rhetoric that unfortunately continues to be perpetuated today that this is all the contribution of Latinos. But that's not enough, certainly not enough. Because now President Trump will continue the myth, false and divisive rhetoric, that now we have, quote unquote, a wave of Central Americans who are invading this country. So again, today I'm going to talk about all these contributions that have made this country what it is, but unfortunately, this is what tends to be the focus. And because this is the focus, quote unquote, an invasion, we have individuals who take it upon themselves, believe themselves to be, quote unquote, good patriots, to do this. The notion that good patriots need to arm themselves and go to the border to protect it from, quote, the invaders. And because sensationalism sells, sensationalism gets your attention, this is what the news focuses on. That again, if Latinos contribute anything here, it's crime, it's instability. And soon that rhetoric spreads, and the idea is that we need to protect our country and send a force to protect us from the criminals, the invaders, those who are here to cause us harm. I mentioned that I heard something this morning which I was not aware of, and that something is that one of our own students at ARC was detained by ICE back in June, and he's still in a detention office. 
one of our own students here, which again brings this to all of us. It's not just something happening in LA or San Francisco or in the East Coast or the South. It's here. So what did he do wrong? What was his crime? He was brought here as a child. And what was he doing at ARC? Getting his degree. A degree for what purpose? So he can advance his life and contribute to this country. That was his crime. So I start with this to emphasize it's false and divisive. Because what we're going to see is that the contributions that quote unquote Hispanics and Latinos have made and continue to make are much more significant and in greater numbers than the notion that there's an invasion or criminals or what have you. We need to be aware of this as an institution of higher learning to go beyond the false claims, the rhetoric, even if it's coming, unfortunately, from our own administration. And certainly, I would hope that our administration will learn this history that I'm about to give you. Because then you will begin to have a different mindset about the value of these individuals in our country. I am a professor of Latin American history, Mexican American history, world history. And as such, it is vital to understand terms of identity. How do we develop these terms? Why are they so significant? What do they mean? And certainly my Latin American history classes and my Chicano history classes, Mexican American history classes, I get the question time and again, well, what does this term mean? Who does this term apply to? And what about that term? So what I'm going to do is give you just a brief run through. Very simple, very reductive, but nevertheless, just to get a sense of what do some of these terms mean? Whom do they apply to? And so forth. So first and foremost, I want to say again as a historian that this term has been applied, embraced, by peoples of Hispanic, i.e. Spanish ancestry, much earlier before any person of English ancestry began to apply this term. Americano, American. An American just basically means someone, a resident of the Americas. Well, where are the Americas? We live in the Americas. We're part of the Americas. The Americas are from Canada, Canada, down to Argentina, Argentina, and into the Caribbean. That's America. Professor Caton, but, but we live in America, the United States. Yes, the United States of America. I invite all of you to go back to our founding document, the Declaration of Independence. And you'll notice that Declaration of Independence states these United States of America, not America, because America is all of the Western Hemisphere. So who are Americans? We are all Americans. Whether you're from North America, Central America, South America, or the Caribbean, you are an American. Latin American. Well, now we get a little more specific. Latin American or Latino makes reference to the countries from Mexico and North America. And yes, Mexicans are North Americans, not Central Americans, not South Americans, North Americans. From Mexico and North America to the Central American countries to South America and the Caribbean. That is Latin America. Latinos. Latinx. This is the most recent of these terms for the sake of identity. 
and Latinx attempts to be gender neutral, to move beyond the binary, very much embraced, no problem. A gender neutral interpretation, embracement of Latino, Latin X. Hispanic. Now, Hispanic is actually a term that was first created by the US government. It's a creation by the US government. And Hispanic was to emphasize someone who comes from Spanish origins or Spanish roots, a speaker of Spanish in itself, according to the US government. That is a Hispanic. So certainly, not all Latinos are Hispanic. Why not? Because not all Latinos have Spanish roots. So Hispanic is specific to someone who embraces, identifies with some cultural roots to Spain. Hispanic. Spanish. Now this one is interesting because I hadn't really heard this term, being a native Californian, until I moved to the East Coast. And in the East Coast, it's very common for individuals to believe that anyone who speaks Spanish is a Spanish person. You're Spanish. So I recall this uh, a humorous situation in which I arrive in the East Coast, Massachusetts to be precise, and I'm entering this college for the first time as a professor, and my colleagues mentioned that they'd like to take me out to eat. I say, beautiful, thank you so much. And they say, yeah, we're going to go have some Spanish food. And I say, wow, I've never had Spanish food. Some paella maybe, right? Go have some paella, let's do it. And they take me to a Puerto Rican restaurant. Because in their eyes, in their mind, Spanish means Puerto Rican as well. They're all Spanish peoples. But think about how ironic or how, erone how wrong that is. If we speak English, are we English people? Certainly we're English, right? Because we speak English. Does that make sense? No. So it doesn't make sense that a Puerto Rican or a Mexicano or an Argentino would be a Spanish person, because they're not. Do Spanish people exist? Absolutely. Mainly in Spain, that's where they live. But certainly have Spanish peoples throughout the world. Spanish from Spain. But interestingly, in the East Coast, this is a common term. To refer to all peoples of Latin America as quote unquote Spanish. Chicano. Now this is much more a US Southwest and California term. And Chicano doesn't really come about in terms of mainstream until the 1960s. In the 1960s, during the Civil Rights Movement, Mexican Americans decide to embrace this term for themselves as a term of uh, self-worth, uh, as a term of self-empowerment, to be a Chicano. Basically, you could say Mexican American, but there's more to it. There's social, political, economic connotations that go with being a Chicano. Chicanex, yet another recent term, right? Much like Latinx, Chicanex is used now as a gender neutral form for Chicano. To move away from being Chicano male or Chicana female is a weird gender neutral Chicanex. So whenever you hear these terms now, just keep in mind that that's the process, the thinking process there. Let us move away from the binaries. Latino, Latina, Chicano, Chicana, Latinx, Chicanex. Hyphenation, and this of course is just historically part of the United States of America, to hyphenate. The notion that through the hyphenation, you provide the ancestral country of origin with quote unquote American. And in this context, American stands for the United States. That you are Italian American, Irish American, Mexican American, and so forth. So here you have a creation of various terms, terms that at times have been applied to you without necessarily your consent. Other times you embrace those terms because you willingly want to have that term. So the question that certainly many of my students ask, what's the correct term, quote unquote? So what's the term that I should use? Well, all of them are correct. You're going to have to do a little bit of your own homework as to how does this person, particular person, identify? 
Do they identify more with their Spanish roots, i.e. Hispanic? Do they identify more with Latino roots, Latino? Are they much more into their Mexican-American roots, Chicano, and so forth? So we would all like a nice little term, tell me what to call, whatever, what have you. Get to know them. That's the best approach. Get to know someone. Find out what do they prefer. How do they prefer to be called? Many peoples take various of these, several of these. I'm Latino, and I'm Chicano. Or I'm Chicanx, and I am, and so forth. It's about asking. It's about getting to know someone else not just having the nice little term that you can apply to everyone. Forming the Americas. In my Latin American history classes, I also emphasize to my students that there is no one Latin American people. It's peoples. Certainly, the peoples of Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina and the Caribbean, are the overall centuries of coming together and mixing, sometimes willingly, other times without their consent, of peoples from Europe, Asia, and Africa. That is Latin America. Latin America is certainly one of the most diverse places in the world. Not the only, but one of the most diverse places in the world. Precisely because you have peoples from all of these parts of the world that have come together to create what we call Latin American peoples, cultures, and so forth. But the question is, well, what about this country of ours, the United States of America? What are the roots? Where are the roots? And here I'm thinking to myself, well, let's look at the usual starting point, where usually K through 12 likes to begin about the birth of this country, America, quote unquote America. And it tends to go to this, right? Columbus. The idea that it all goes back to Christopher Columbus. That Columbus is the starting point of this country, supposedly. OK. So I said to myself, fine. Let me take that as fact, quote unquote. If we want to start with Columbus being the beginning of this country, then it's important to keep in mind that Columbus first arrives in the Bahamas. That's where Columbus landed in October of 1492. It's the Bahamas. And from the Bahamas, Columbus is going to go on and explore, quote unquote, and proclaim the greater Antilles as they're known, the islands of Cuba what the Spanish call La Isla Española, the Spanish island. Today, the nations of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Jamaica. All of those lands, Columbus will proclaim that they now belong to Spain. And sure enough, from that process, again, just keeping in mind the way that K-12 tends to discuss the situation, is that this is the beginnings of what eventually is going to become the United States. The center of European presence in the Americas, if we're just focusing on the Europeans, is La Isla Española, the Spanish island, today's Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which means that from the get-go, in terms of long-term presence of Europeans in the Americas, it's Spaniards. Spanish. I also remind my students that the first European hospital in the Americas is Spanish. The first university in the Americas is Spanish. The first European language spoken in the Americas is Spanish. So if we're talking about the historical roots, the Hispanic roots of this country, then we got to admit that Spanish is absolutely necessary to understand the history of the Spaniard and their history here in the Americas. The first official permanent settlement of Europeans in the Americas is again what today is the Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, 1502. 
Why is that so important to understand, to know? Because it won't be until 1607 that we have Jamestown. So we're talking 100 years of Spanish presence already in the Americas before we even get to the English coming into the picture. But you can say, OK, professor, that's all fine and good, but we're talking about the mainland, today's United States. OK, so I give you this, San Agustin, La Florida, the first official European settlement in what today is the mainland Ameri United States of America. So what does that tell us once again? Spanish influence before we even get to the English. This country, no matter what the rhetoric may be today and how popular it may be, is one of immigrants. From the very get-go, it is immigrants from outside coming in to Native American territories where people already resided and lived and they begin to create their own societies. But they're immigrants. This is a country of immigrants, period. Here's another point I want to make. And this I take from another historian, Felipe Fernandez Armesto, historian of world history. He reminds us, no country has unchanging essence. No community has an unchanging identity. What it means to be English or Chinese or Spanish or Indonesian or American changes all the time. There was never a time when most of Americans or most people in what is now the United States were white English Protestants. And this is the rhetoric today, somehow that this country has always been, quote unquote, white English Protestant, and the majority has been white English Protestant. That's just simply not true. The making of a country has been a collective effort, sometimes collaborative, sometimes conflictive, of all the ethnic and religious minorities who inhabit it. So we got to remember that this country, again, is a combination of these different groups that came in. It is the mixing, it is the cohabiting, not always friendly, but it is there. So to ever jump to the conclusion that, quote unquote, there was ever a pure, supposedly, peoples here, a white English Protestant peoples that were the majority, historically, that is false. When we think of US history, people love to talk about war. The wars that we fought, right? What wars have the United States been involved in? And usually, the go-to wars, American Revolution, right? US Civil War, and World War II. These are the wars that certainly I know my students love to hear about. They want to learn more about, especially World War II. There's this fascination with World War II. All right, very well. And again, the belief is that, quote unquote, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were the ones involved in these things. That really there was no other group that participated much. And that in itself is also doing away with history, trying to erase history. Because sure enough, one of the biggest myths is up here, that a small group of quote unquote patriots were able to take on the mighty British Empire, and they won. Why? Because they fought for freedom and liberty. All right. But what about all of those indigenous allies, Native American allies that fought along? We rarely hear about them. At your 4th of July picnic with your hamburger and your hot dog, rarely do you think about or thank all those Native Americans who contributed to our freedom and liberty. And not just the Native Americans, what about the French? And what about the Spanish as well? Sure enough, in this revolution, it was vital for the colonial soldiers to get some help from the enemies of Britain. And one of the key enemies of Britain, historical enemy, was Spain. 
So certainly the Spanish are going to contribute to get at their enemy, the British, to help out these 13 colonies obtain their independence. By helping the colonial military, you are punching your enemy, the British. Spanish colonial subjects will also contribute to this, especially in money and resources. Two places in particular, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Havana, Cuba, the peoples of those territories provided money. Famously, Cuban women, wealthy Cuban women, providing jewels for the cause of this American Revolution so that the American revolutionaries can have the resources, the money, to go ahead and continue this war. But that won't be enough because indeed, by 1779, now Spain actually sends fighters, combatants, to help out fight against the British. The Spanish heritage, the Spanish roots, have been there from the beginning of this country. Peoples of Spanish ancestry have been vital in creating this country. The Civil War, yet another war we're so enamored with, the idea of going back to the Civil War and so forth, and how this war was so essential in really creating this country that we have today, the North versus the South, and so on. But again, we have people of Hispanic origins who lived here already during this time. And because they live here, they will also be brought into this conflict, especially Mexican-Americans. Mexican-Americans were vital in this civil war, both for the North and the South. An estimated 20,000 Hispanic Latinos. Now, why can we not say for certain how many served? Because at this point, not being black, meant that you were quote unquote white. So many a Mexican American were just plainly considered white, not that they were treated as such, but they were considered that on paper, white quote unquote. Most came from California, Texas, and New Mexican territory, but a majority will fight for the Union. But again, both North and South, the Latino presence, the Hispanic presence, and in this case especially, the Mexican-American presence was there. And here I give you just two examples. Captain Joseph de la Garza from the Confederate States of America, i.e. the Confederacy, and Captain Rafael Chacon of the Union, the United States of America. All right, but World War II. World War II is the war, professor. World War II is, quote unquote, the greatest generation. Yes, the greatest generation. All right. During this war, certainly the United States is going to get involved. And in this war, you're going to have the Latino presence front and center. Over 500 Hispanics or Latinos will fight in this war, will get involved because, after all, this is their country, and their country is at war. In addition to their male counterparts, Hispanic Latina women contributed to the military efforts by joining the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, the WAC, as they were known, an official organization of the Army that filed, excuse me, that uh, filled non-combatant jobs. So even if you were not picking an arm, a weapon, and going off to fight, you were still doing your job. You were still doing your contribution for our country during this war. But certainly, we were there. We were in Europe. We were in the Pacific. Mexican Americans, Latinos, were very much there because again, this is their country calling upon them to go and fight. And they heeded the call. Here you have Sergeant Jose Lopez receiving his Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, when he returns to the States in Texas, he will be imprisoned because, quote unquote, he's a rowdy Mexican. So rather than giving him the thank you for his service, instead he was treated, unfortunately, as Mexicans were treated at the time, as unwanted individuals, regardless of whether you were Mexican from Mexico or Mexican-American born and raised in the United States.
Rosie the Riveter. We love to point to Rosie the Riveter and the work that Rosie the Riveter did. She was there. We can do it. Yes. And Las Rositas were there too. Rosita was there and she was vital to the war effort. Mexican American women, Latina women in general, joined the labor force to pick up the slack that was left by the men who went off to fight. The Hispanic presence, the Latino presence, the Latino presence, it has been there from the beginning. Okay, that's all fine and good, professor. That's history. But what about now? What about today? What have Latinos contributed? They continue to contribute. Politics. You want politics? Regardless of party, Democrat or Republican, Latinos are there in the forefront. In 2016, we had a presidential candidate, a Latino, Marco Rubio. In 2020, or 2019, 2020, we have yet another presidential candidate. This time, we have Julian Castro. And has she made a name for herself out here in public? Whether you like what she does or does not like what she does, she is representative of how Latinos are at the forefront, certainly, of serving this country. Business. We have a lot of rhetoric today about supporting business. We don't need to bring business back. Business is at the core of our country. So have Latinos in business. Top business firms in the United States created and run by Latinos. This is according to the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. Latinos generated 2.1 one three two point thirteen trillion in gross domestic product in the United States in 2015. So we're talking in the trillions. Contributing to whose economy? Our economy, the U.S. economy. The strengthening this great economy that we like to tell, Latinos have been part of that, contributing to that. 86% of scaled immigrant owned firms, those with one million plus in revenue, are owned by millennials who happen to migrate for, uh, to the United States. So immigrant Latinos are contributing to this country's economy. We hear a lot about they take from our economy and they take from our services. What about everything that's given back to this country? We overlook that because that's not a sensational. We like sensationalism. Female entrepreneurship plays a large role in the ascendance of Latinos in the ranks of U.S. businesses. Female Latino-owned businesses increased 87% from 2007 to 2012, and now represent nearly half of all Latino businesses. That's not enough. Latinos are the top entrepreneurs right now surpassing Three other key groups, white, quote unquote, African American and Asian. Latinos are much more entrepreneurs, much more uh, to create a business than the other groups. Contributing to this country's economy. Art. We like to boast how great our art is to the world, the artists who have contributed this great art to our country. Latinos have been there. Literature. Some of the top authors of the United States are Latinos. When the United States has its work read outside of the United States, Latino authors are there because of how significant their contributions are. Hollywood, ah, uh, Latinos in Hollywood, they make a lot of money, yes. That goes to our economy. Latinos have been there from the beginnings of Hollywood, certainly up to today. Some of the top grossing films, some of the top grossing TV shows, Latinos are front and center. Sports. Even sometimes Latinos, you didn't know we're Latinos. 
are there. Every sport, Latinos have contributed immensely to the legacy of that sport. So what have contrib uh, Latinos contributed to this country? You name it. Music. From the classics to today, I guess, Latinos are there at the forefront bringing about those hits that you love to listen to, that you love to download. It's Latinos there contributing to that economy, contributing to the presence that the United States has in the world in terms of art, music, literature, and so forth. And here's one that I especially wanted to highlight because we're currently building this brand new building here next door. This building that's supposed to be about math, engineering, science, STEM. So what have Latinos contributed to STEM? Already in 1974, there was an official organization that promoted, reached out to have more, in this case, originally Mexican-Americans, go into the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And soon, this organization, MAES, will be joined by yet another organization, this SHIP, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Both key societies that promote Latinos in STEM to emphasize, again, those contributions that we make to this country. And through programs such as this, we've had individuals be emboldened to decide to pursue STEM a field that for the most part in this country, unfortunately, is a field that many an educator told young Latinos, you're not meant for this. Educators themselves, you're not good at math. You're not good at science. This is not your field. But we have Latinos who are certainly right there at the forefront leading these organizations. And by leading these organizations, they have also contributed to the outcome of such things. Astronauts, Latino astronauts who've been there, again, contributing to the successes of this country. Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, originally from San Jose, Costa Rica, moves to the United States because he believes in this country. And indeed, he believed in it so much that he tried as much as possible to educate himself to the opportunities in this country and eventually became an astronaut. But he's not alone. Dr. Elena Ochoa currently serves as the director of the Space Center, Houston uh, Johnson Space Center. Carlos Noriega, originally from Peru, also goes on to get his degree in science and will be able to become an astronaut. Local individual here from Stockton will also go on to get his degree in science and go on to become an astronaut. So again, what have Latinos contributed to this country? What have they not contributed to this country? And all of this stuff that I mentioned, just briefly, just touching on it, is lost. And why is it lost? Because the loudest voice at the moment says this stuff. So it doesn't matter all these contributions that Latinos have made and continue to make. The sensationalism is what you hear, what you grab onto, and what you begin to believe that this is the reality, that this is a reality, and that Latinos really have contributed nothing to this country. If anything, they just take and take and take, quote unquote. So did I make all this stuff up? Is this, in the words of our administration, fake news? 
You, as an educated population, should only coming here to an institution of higher education, should know this stuff. Take my classes. Little plug there. Latin American history, we offer it. Chicano, Mexican American history, we offer it. Learn about the contributions, understand who and what have been there so that we can move away from the ignorance, unfortunately, the divisiveness, the rhetoric that says all we are are people who should be detained. That this is all we are, Latinos. Nonsense. Nonsense. Now, I do want to apologize briefly because I had invited some guests before they even knew that I was going to touch on this stuff. So I do apologize to them. Certainly this is me giving you this information. They're not necessarily connected to this. But I do want to, to emphasize what they're doing because you see, the guests that I asked to come with me today happen to be the next generation of SHIP members. The Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And why did I ask him to come? Because this, again, highlights, underscores, that the contributions by Latinos are still taking place. This is our country. We contribute to our country. And this is just another example of that contribution still at work. If you don't mind, just bump, please come forward. Now, a little bit of background history. Uh, ARC SHIP emphasizes in uh, helping like all the Latinx and also Hispanic communities and trying to emphasize and develop a more like STEM related, well, STEM related STEM curricular and STEM careers and trying to be more professional, trying to get more of the uh, professional aspects and getting to like uh, getting a, a better job, trying to, uh, trying to help like to benefit for like, not only for the United States, but for the whole world. And as mentioned, um, right now, like the people who you actually just saw, Jose M. Hernandez, he actually um, is one of our, like, going to potentially be one of our keynote speakers we're going to try to bring here to American River College, just mostly uh, to help, like, emphasize the most important, like, it, the reason of, of the education, how that impacts for all the students, and how as well, like, uh, for the Latinx, or the, whole, for the whole Hispanic and Latinx communities as well. Now, as mentioned, for you know, the Latin, like I said, Latino myself, and it's actually quite true. I actually have been told many previous times during my time at high school, middle school, even elementary, I actually had like a really high emphasis that I wanted to go into like the STEM curriculum. I actually want to become like, you know, the next Jose Hernandez, or like even, you know, have a Steve Jobs for like, you know, the old Hispanics communities. But mo like what he says, it's all true as far as like we've been rejected. It's not just me. We actually have a few members as well who actually been rejected to the idea to get into like a very high, uh, very competitive um, environment. Many people have been telling me or to anyone else like you're not good at math. You can't, even, you know, you're not good at math. You, you can't, you, you know, you can't. Or you're not good at STEM or, or sciences or engineering or mathematics overall. But. Today, what I've been seeing in this contribution for like the whole entire uh, society, of, well, to the whole like American society, is that believe it or not, we actually are getting more of a population, more of a, uh, uh, an, in an interest in STEM and in STEM curricular activities for all Latinx. And as of right now, uh, part of ship uh, that we actually are trying to do is that we're trying to like as well uh, let the whole community for ARC uh, to know that we actually have a program not only just for Hispanics, Latinx, but as well for like anyone, like any other minorities as well. Because there's, it's not just Hispanics, it's also for blacks, Asians, uh, uh, island, island Pacific Islanders, yes. They're actually are going through like the same pro uh, phase, same problem as well, that we, like even myself, actually have experience. So I actually can connect with them a lot. And having an organization like SHIP, actually can actually provide better opportunities, a bit, way better opportunities, and as well like 
uh, more of a readiness to like get uh, to get ready to like work into like the most competitive industries. And they're actually, I have actually have connected with a few um, Hispanic and Latinx uh, individuals who actually are now working in like big companies right now, who actually have in big companies as in like Tesla, NASA, Boeing. Those are actually like the companies that are, you, as right now, even you read in the headlines, actually make a really big uh, impact to like the American society, but also for the whole world. As of right now, like SpaceX is trying to like send uh, a million people or a million people up into space and to like live into Mars, mostly just for the benefit for the humanity, uh, for humanity, just to like live on. Also Tesla, as of right now, we actually have lived more we have lived, uh, I believe, a hundred, more than a hundred years now in combustion, uh, depending on combustion engines. But the history, again with the history, we could have actually have uh, uh, developed for better technologies like electric uh, vehicles. But again, his ship is not only for the Hispanics, it's for anyone who actually have a passion and desire to like come and actually want to develop in their STEM, uh, in their STEM profession. And as for that, um, I just want to thank you again, Katon, for actually appreciate inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you, everyone. So just bomb. Thank you. So I was very happy uh, when I got, received the invitation to give this talk. Because again, my intention from the beginning was to highlight, emphasize the contributions that Latinos have made as a historian, to point that out. Um, but again, with these news that I received, I felt that I have to bring this other portion into play because that seems to be the focus. And I hope that that focus, that negativity about supposedly who Latinos are and what they do and what they contribute to this country, we can move past that to highlight all of the positives that Latinos have made. And thank you for being here. If anything, I just wanted to give you a taste of, again, how complex and how significant the contributions of Latinos, Hispanics have been to this country. And I hope that this now gives you the incentive to learn more, to take more classes, to try to understand this much better than perhaps you're understanding right now.